Okay, we restart. So in the last lecture, we showed that for any irreducible Markov chain, there exists a unique stationary distribution. And now the another two topics of today is we will show that the Markov chain, for time long enough, it will converge to the stationary distribution. The first notion is called ergodic theorem. So for ergodic theorem, we always show that the, the space average of the Markov chain will converge to the stationary distribution. So ergodic theorem tells us if we have an irreducible Markov chain, and f is any function, what we have is uh, we sum it from time 0 to n minus 1 and then normalized by the number. And this quantity will converge to a constant. So this constant is the expectation of f under the stationary measure. We can also write it as the multiplication of a row vector and a column, and a column vector. So it's the same thing, almost surely. And in particular, if we set our function f, it's just a direct function. Mm, direct function at a vertex x. Then this theorem tells us If we calculate, yes? I'm sorry, why is it called an ergodic theorem? I mean, for example, in another course, we mm -hmm. saw that ergodic theory was theory of events that had probability zero or one because they were invariant by translation. How do you relate this notion ah. to uh, what we saw? Uh, so, so first, this name is before the ergodic theorem of what is that. OK, but how do those two uh, notions are related? One, Yes. Hmm. Why they are related? I think that it's because the meaning is converting to something. Okay, I'm not sure why they have the same name. But yes, this is also called a Gaudic theorem. <laughs> okay. So for this ergodic theorem, if we set this function f is to be a direct function, so what we can have from this relation is we calculate how many visits to a vertex x from time 0 to n minus 1, and will be normalized by n. And this quantity will converge almost surely to pi x. So this tells us if we just calculate how many visits to x, before n. So this random variable will increase more or less the same as n times pi x. So this pi x gives us the average, the space average of the Markov chain. So the times the, the number of visits of the Markov chain to one vertex will increase as n times pi x. So this pi x gives us the density that how much the Markov chain spent at a one vertex. Okay, so this is the meaning for this ergodic theorem. And now uh, let us show why this is true. So just a, a quick remark. So in this relation, if our sequence xj is an IID sequence, then this equation is just exactly a, large, a law of larger numbers. So if xj is IID. But of course, we, we are now showing that if even though this xj is not IID, it is a Markov chain. So there is dependence between the neighbors. But this is still true. OK, so this is one remark. And another remark is, so I wrote p mu almost surely. So this notation means x0 starts from a measure mu. And then this p mu is the probability measure for this whole Markov chain. And the p mu almost surely, it just means if we start from a measure mu, we have this truth almost surely. But since mu can be written as a linear combination of Dirac measures,
We want to show this relation holds p mu almost surely. It is sufficient to show the relation is true under px almost truly. So px just means the mark of chain starts from x. And for general case, we can just uh, show in that this p mu is the linear combination of this px, and each one is almost surely true. So this also tells us under this measure, it is also almost surely true. OK, so we will prove the theorem under px almost surely. So we suppose our mark of chain starting from x. Uh, yes, everything is finite now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so suppose we start from a vertex x, and as I just said, if this sequence is an IID sequence, then it is already true. But how to go how to from a Markov chain to get an IID sequence? One possible way is. We just divide this Markov chain according to when it raises x. So it starts from x. And after tau, tau x plus, it's coming back to x. And after it's coming back to x, we know that now it is just a new Markov chain starting from x. So it is independent of what happens to the first rung. And then we divide this path according to the second time it's coming back to x. And then the future part is also depend, uh, independent of what happens to the first and the second round. So this gives us a decomposition of a Markov chain. And if we decompose this Markov chain according to this visiting time of x, we get a, a sequence of IID blocks. OK, so this is the idea. So if we start from a vertex x, now we define the sequence of time that we're going back to x. So we start from 0 and tau 1. Is the, first, is the first return time to x. And generally, tau k plus 1 is the first time after tau k that we go back to x. And as I explained before, so for different k from 0, 1, 2, we get a block And for different k, these blocks are IID. They all have the same law as the Markov chain starting from x and going back to x, and stopped after going back to x. So all these blocks have the same law, and they are IID. So for different k, they are IID. And in particular, because these blocks are IID, and if we define functional on these blocks, so yk. So we just summing over from for, from for time from tau k to tau k plus 1. And then this sequence yk is iid. And also, if we consider the time difference, this time difference is also iid. And all of them has the same law as tau 1. OK, so from the fact that these blocks are IID, we can conclude that the sequence of YK is IID. And the, time, the sequence of time difference is also IID. And since they are IID, now we can apply law of large numbers. Law of large numbers. Is, is it written like this? L. 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 OK, right. Law of large numbers, yes. So by law of large numbers, we know that uh, this one will converge to the expectation almost surely.
And this one also converge to the expectation almost surely. Because this tau n is just a summation for this time difference from 0 to n. So this guy also converged to the expectation almost surely. And combining these two, we know that So we just divide this quantity over this quantity. What we have is this quantity will converge almost surely to a constant. OK, and here we can see that this is from 0 to tau n minus 1 and normalized by tau n. And in the theorem, we're just for some general n, so from 0 to n and normalized by n. So if we can show that this is true for a particular choice of sequence tau n, in fact, we can show that it is true for any sequence. So this is, uh, you can see the detail of this part for, uh, in the exercise. But now, so I just said uh, the conclusion is, if we can show the conclusion for this relation, for, for, the, for this n true for the sequence tau n, then it is true for general n. OK, so now we have already shown that for this particular time sequence tau n, this sequence will converge to a constant. And the fin finally, we only need to check what, what is this constant and whether it is the same as the right hand side there. So now what's this constant? So what is the expectation of tau uh, of y zero? This is the uh, definition of y zero. And here we know that this f is a function, and in fact this f can be written as. Uh, can be written as a linear function, a linear combination of direct functions. So I just uh, plug in this one. For all y, so xy. So just to uh, written this uh, function f as a linear combination of direct functions. And now I take the summation of this part outside the expectation. equals this one. And now j is from 0 to tau 1 minus 1. So in fact, we are summing for j less, less than tau 1. So if we just remove tau 1 minus 1 by infinity and put the restriction here, it is the same thing. It is very familiar. We have already constructed it when we construct the stationary distribution. So when we construct the stationary distribution, if we choose the starting point is x, then this is exactly the same definition as pi two tau y. When we construct this, when we prove the existence of stationary distribution, this is exactly the same as pi two tau y, and we start from x here. And from the construction of stationary distribution, we know that this pi two tau y equals pi y times the total mass of pi two tau. And the total mass, total mass of pi tuta is the expectation of tau 1. So now what we have is it equals y, fy, 
times pi y times the expectation of tau 1. And this is exactly the same as pi times f. And this is the constant ex tau 1. So now the expectation of y0 normalized by the expectation tau 1 is exactly the pi, pi f. Okay, so this is the proof for a Gaulic theorem. Okay, so in this agotic theorem, we see that the average of time for the Markov chain span that of one vertex will converge to the stationary distribution. And next, in the, uh, in the convergence theorem, we will show that we have a convergence in a stronger sense. So this convergence means p n x dot is the law of x n, pi is the stationary distribution. And in this theorem, we show that the distance between these two probabil probability measure will decay exponentially faster than n. So first, we need to introduce what's this, what's this dis distance between two probability measures. It is called total variation distance. So total variation distance gave a distance between two probability measures. Suppose mu and mu are two probability measures. And we define the total variation distance between the two in this way. This is definition of total variation distance. So it is the max over all possible subset of omega such that the difference between mu a and mu a and here we can see that this distance is, this, uh, is the distance between two probability measures in a very strong sense. Because if we know that the distance is small in this sense, it says that for any set A, the distance between mu A and mu A is very small. So this is a really uh, strong sense of distance between two probability measures. Okay, so before we prove the convergence theorem, I will give two uh, different characterizations of this total variation distance. Okay, so before that, let us uh, do a small exercise, show that total variation distance is a metric space. So total variation distance satisfies triangle inequality. In fact, you can see the proof just uh, repeats, the, just a repetition of the definition. So it satisfies triangle inequality. So first, to the left hand side, we know that the left hand side is the max over all possible A in this way. And this is Bounded by, uh, this is triangle inequality for real numbers. And we know that this guy is bounded by the total variation distance between mu and eta. And this one is bounded by the total variation distance between eta and nu. And now, This is true for any subset A. So now we take max over all possible A. What we have is 
the total variation distance is bounded by this one. And this shows that the total variation distances satisfies triangle inequality. So it does give a metric on the space of probability measures. OK, so this is uh, the definition of total variation distance. And now I will give, us, give you two equivalent ways to define total variation distance. The first is the total variation distance is the same as the distance between matrix. So just a, a quick recall, what's the distance between two matrices? So distance. The distance between matrices A and B. So suppose B, A and B are two matrices and they have the same size. Then the distance between these two matrices This is the definition of uh, distance between two matrices. And in this lemma, we show that the total variation distance is half of the distance between these two row vectors. So in this lemma, we show that the total variation distance is one half of the distance in the sense if we will these two vectors as two row vectors and this is the distance and the matrix distance. Okay, so in this lemma we show that in fact the total variation distance is the same as the matrix dis uh, distance. So why this is true? So this is the definition of total variation distance. So it takes max over all possible a, such as mu a minus nu a. And here we want to find the good a so that it, it attains the maximum. So we define We define set B, it is the vertex such that mu x is always greater than mu x. And the claim is the total variation distance equals mu b minus nu b. So this is the first claim. So, so first, let us prove this claim. So why this is true? So first, from the definition of total variation distance, we know that the total variation distance, the left-hand side, is greater than the right-hand side. This is from the definition of total variation distance. We only need to show that the right-hand side is also greater than the left-hand side. So why this is true? For any subset A, We need to show that this quantity is, uh, is less than this guy. OK, so now let us compare what's the distance between this one and this one. So here is I've done nothing. I just uh, split set A according to A intersect B or A intersect B complement. And in this expression, we can see that this part is negative because in the complement of B, we know that mu x is always greater than mu x, is always less than mu x. So this part is always negative. And then this quantity is always less than mu b minus nu b because 
So A intersects with B has less element than B. And this dif difference in the element, so for those uh, elements in B but not in A, they have a con positive contribution in mu minus nu. So this one is always less than this one. So here we have shown that for any subset A, mu A minus nu A is bounded by this quantity. Because, but in the definition of the total variation distance, we need to take the absolute value. So we also need to show that mu A minus mu A is bounded by the same quantity. OK, we repeat the same procedure, repeat exactly the same procedure. We can show that this one is bounded by nu B complement minus mu B complement. So just to repeat the same row. And the only difference is now we switch the role of mu and the new. So B complement is the set at that new is greater. So the only difference is we just switch the role of mu and the new. And since both of them, mu and new are probability measures, so this guy equals one minus new B, and this guy equals one minus new B. So it is exactly the same as mu bi minus nu b. So for here we have shown that for any set A, this absolute value is bounded by mu b minus nu b. This is true for any subset A. So we take max over the left, we, we show that the total variation distance is less than this quantity. So this shows that the left hand side is greater than right, is less than right hand side. So this completes the proof of the claim. So the claim shows that the total variation distance is just uh, all, pos all positive contribution here. Okay, so this is the first claim. The second claim, we will show that the distance at the right hand side here is twice of this quantity. And then combining with the first claim, we uh, complete the proof of this lemma. OK, so in fact, this guy is also immediate. So the left hand side, we just divide this summation into two parts. When x is in B, or x in B complement, And when x is in B, because we are taking absolute value, so in, when x is inside B, we know that this guy is greater than this guy. And when in B complement, this guy is greater than that guy. So this is exactly the absolute value. And for the first part, we know that it equals mu B minus nu B. And for the second part, it equals nu B's complement minus mu B complement. And this is exactly twice of the first quantity. OK, so combining these two claim, we show that, in fact, the total variation distance is just one half of the, dist of the matrix distance. This is a first characterization of total variation distance. The second characterization of total variation distance is from probability sense. So it shows that for any coupling of two probability measure x and y, this total variation distance is the infimum such that x, y are distinct, uh, the probability for x, y are distinct. So first, 
definition of a coupling. We say that a pair of random variable x, y, is a coupling of measure mu and nu if the marginal law of x the marginal law of x is mu and the marginal law of y is mu and here of course uh, given the measure mu and nu there are uh, various different coupling between the two measures Okay, so just a quick uh, example. Suppose mu equals nu equals Bernoulli one half. We can construct a, a lot of different coupling between these two measures. So for example, first coupling, we just set C is a Bernoulli random variable. And then set x equals y equals z. This is one coupling of these two measures. Or we can sample x and y. They are iid Bernoulli. And then this is also a coupling between two measures. And in the first coupling, we see that the probability for x distinct from y uh, is what? Is zero. Because they're always it's the same. But in the second one, what's the probability for this to be distinct? It's one half. So both of them are coupling of these two measures, but the probability for these two random variables to be distinct can be very different. And in the second equivalent way to define a, prob a total variation distance is we can show that for any probability measure t, a mu and nu, the total variation distance It is the infimum of the probability that the x is distinct from y for any coupling. And also, we will later, we will prove the theorem. And this theorem, we can, in the proof of the theorem, we can also say that, in fact, this infimum can be, obta can be obtainable. So, and, and so then we call that x, y is the optimal coupling if this distinct probability is exactly the inf, is exactly the total variation distance. And from the uh, example here, we can see that if these two measures are exactly the same, then we can just set these two random variables equals each other. And then this probability is zero. So this gives us a sense that they should be the same because if the two measures are the same, we can easily construct a, a coupling so that this probability is also zero. But the question is, if the measure is dif different, we have to construct a coupling so that the, this probability is exactly the, the total variation distance between two measures. Okay, so first part, first part of the proof. So clearly we have two steps. The first step is we show that the total variation distance 
is less than this probability for any coupling. This is the first step. In this, after we prove the first step, we know that the total variation distance is less than this infinite. And the second step, we need to show that if we can construct So this is the total variation distance, the second way to characterize the total variation distance. So it's this, um, so in the first, first sense, it tells us this total variation distance is the same as the matrix distance. And in the second sense, it's where we know from the probability measure. So it's really tell us there is, is there, we can get a coupling of two random variables so that they are pretty close. Okay, so first, first step, how to show the total variation distance is less than this probability for any coupling. From the definition of total variation distance is the max over all this set. And since x and the y is a coupling of these two measures, this quantity is the same as the probability that x is in A. And new A is the probability that y is in A. Because x, the marginal law of x is mu and the marginal law of y is new. And then, this is less than the probability that x in A but y not in A. You can just uh, write out the probability that this guy equals x in A, y in A, and then x in A, y not in A, and also write it in the same way, and you can show that this one is always the right. And since x in A, but y not in A, implies that x, y are distinct. So now what we have is new A minus new A is always less than this probability to that they are distinct. So we want to construct a coupling so that they're equal as often as possible. And I suppose this is the density function of two measures. So this is mu, the density function. And this is mu. Now we have three different parts. In this part, mu is greater. In this part, mu is greater. And in this part, is the part that they are below everything, below both mu and mu. And the idea is, in fact, when we construct this uh, coupling, we would require x, y equals each other on this part. And this part, x equals mu on this part, and y equals mu on this part. This is the way that we can have x equals y as often as possible. And another word, from the construction here, we can see that the area of one, so it's just a, a mu x minus mu x, but for x in one. So in one, it's just the same as in b, we use the notation there. So it's the set that uh, i, uh, so one is the set that all x, set that mu x is greater than mu x. So this is exactly the total variation distance. And the same, the area of the second part is also the total variation distance. And the area of the third part <coughs> is one minus the total variation distance. So I just uh, introduced the notation, so P equals 1 minus total variation. And now our idea is we want to construct x, y so that 
x equals y on this is 3. And here equals x and here equals y. So this is our idea. So now we define three probability measures. Gamma 1. is the probability measure corresponds to the first part. So mu x minus mu x, but we normalize by its area. So this is a probability measure. And gamma 2 corresponds to the second part. Gamma 3 corresponds to the third part. Normalized by its area. And now we construct a coupling. So first, we flip a comb. And this coin has the probability p of hat and the probability of 1 minus p of tail. And if hat, then we sample a random variable z according to the law of gamma 3. And then set x equals y equals z. And if tail, we sample x independent of y, and x has the law of gamma 1, and y has the law of gamma 2, and they are independent. And in the second case, we see that since gamma 1 is singular with respect to gamma 2, we know that in this case, X is distinct from Y almost surely. Okay, so now we have a coupling between two random variables. So now we have a coupling, x and y. And I will tell you that this is the coupling we want. So in order to check this is the coupling we want, first we need to check what are the marginal laws. So the marginal law of x, it is with probability p equals gamma 3, and with probability 1 minus p equals gamma 1. And this is exactly mu. And the marginal law of y is p gamma 3 plus 1 minus p gamma 2. And this is exactly mu. And then finally, what's the probability that they are distinct? So, because we first flip a coin, and if this coin is hat, they are always the same. And if the coin is tail, they are distinct. So this is exactly the probability that the coin is tail. And this has the probability 1 minus p. And the 1 minus p is just by definition, it is, two, it is the two variation distance. OK, so this is the coupling. This is the optimal coupling, so that we get the probability for this to be distinct is exactly the total variation distance. Okay, we have a we have a break now, and we restart at uh, quarter past eleven. 
So the convergence theorem says if P is irreducible, are periodic. Then we have that the total variation distance between Pn and pi will decay exponentially fast. Before we prove the theorem, just one uh, remark that why we need to assume aperiodic. So in, in the last lecture, when we introduced was the definition for aperiodic. We introduced one example. It's the simple random walk on a cycle. And from there, we already see that the stationary measure of the simple random walk on a cycle is the uniform measure on the cycle. But if our big N is an even number, is an even number, then it is not aperiodic. So not aperiodic. And in this case, we know that if our Markov chain starts from one, then after steps two n, it will always be in one, three, or five. It can never be in two, four, or six. So as n goes to infinity, we know that in this case, finally, the Markov chain will become uniform in 1, 3, 5 along this 2n. And if we are going along 2n plus 1, finally, the Markov chain will become uniform in 2, 4, 6. So it is impossible for the Markov chain to be very close to the uniform measure on the cycle. So this, is, this tells us, in a general case, this theorem can't be true. So it is only true that when we need to assume that it is aperiodic. So when it is not aperiodic, we can easily construct an example that this theorem can't be true. So this measure doesn't uh, converge to stationary measure and the total variation distance. OK, so this is why in this theorem, we need to have assumption that the P is aperiodic. OK. So now, prove this theorem. So we want to show that the total variation distance decay exponentially fast. It is sufficient to show that the distance between two matrix is very small. And here, this big pi is a matrix of uh, has the same size as n. And each row is pi, is this small pi. So small pi is a row vector. And this big pi is a matrix, n by n matrix. And each row is this small pi. So it is sufficient to show that the matrix distance between these two is very small because it is easier to use matrix multiplication to calculate the difference between Pn and pi. And after we introduce this big pi, we can easily check that big pi times p equals p times big pi equals big pi. And now uh, let us check what is p to the power n. OK, so since we'll assume that p is aperiodic, from the last zero we put in the first lecture, we know that there exists a number r such that prxy is strictly positive for any xy. And then we can find a quantity delta is a strictly positive such that such that prxy is greater than delta times pi y for any x and y. So because this is a strictly positive, and this pi y, so if we divide this quantity by pi y, then it's still strictly positive. And since there are only finitely of them, 
we know that we can find the minimum delta that is strictly positive. And then we can divide this matrix PR in the following way to define a matrix Q such that PR equals delta big pi plus 1 minus delta big Q. And after we define this way, so because our goal is we want to compare PR and delta and the big pi, so this is why we decompose it according to this way. And after we set P, uh, big Q in this way, we can check that Q is stochastic. So each entry is positive because of the relation here. And we also have that big pi times Q equals Q times big pi equals big pi. Delta square pi. Uh, here we can also check that pi square equals pi. Okay, so this is the square pi p q, right? And here we know that pi times q equals q, q times pi equals pi. This is the middle term. And now just to rewrite it, so it is 1 minus theta square big pi plus theta square q square. So this is p to the power 2r. And generally, we can prove by induction that p to the power nr equals 1 minus theta n big pi plus theta n to the power q to the power n. And here we can already see that this p and r is close to big pi. So it is 1 times big pi minus theta n times, beta, uh, times big pi and theta n times qn. And this theta n, because theta is strictly less than 1, so this theta n will decre dec decrease uh, exponentially fast. Okay, so here we can see that the distance between p and r minus big pi equals theta n big pi minus qn as a matrix of this uh, between matrices oh, n. and here this guy this guy is the distance between two matrix and we know that each entry is bounded by two because it's the di distance between one probability minus another probability so each entry is bounded by two in fact, uh, each entry is bounded by one. Okay, each entry is bounded by one, and then total number of the entries is n by n, n is the size of the state space. So this guy is counted, is bounded by a universal constant. So now we have already shown that the distance between p and r and the big pi is bounded by a constant times c to the power, theta to the power n. So this decrease as exponentially fast to zero. This is for uh, p with particular type that it is p to the power nr. And for general nr, for general power, so suppose we have a j less than r greater than zero, p and r plus j. So what is p and r? We also need to show that p and r plus j minus pi is also bounded, is also decay exponentially fast. So what is p and r plus j? This is p and r plus j. And again, we can we see that p and r plus j minus big pi is bounded by c to n times this quantity. And again, it can be bounded by the same constant. 
So this is also smaller than a universal constant C times theta to the power n. OK, so here we have showed that for general m. And we can change this theta a little bigger so that we become alpha to the power m. OK, so this is the proof that the, this is the conversion theorem. So the Markov chain will converge to the stationary distribution exponentially fast. OK. And then finally, today, we will end today by a random model. And in this, mo this model is called top to random shuffle. And in this model, we will see, we will first derive what is the stationary distribution and how fast the Markov chain converge to the stationary distribution. So top to random shuffle. Any question? Okay, top to random shuffle. So this uh, model is suppose we have a deck of n cards. And this is a new deck to suppose over n equals 5. This is a new deck. So all the cards are nicely ordered in this deck. And now, well, before we play a game, we want a uniform deck. So we don't want a deck that is nicely ordered. We want a uniform deck. And this model tells us we have one way to get a uniform um, deck. So this method is called top to random shuffle. So it says that at each step, we pick up the first, uh, uh, we'll pick up the top, the top card on the stack. And then insert this card uniformly to the deck. So suppose it, in, it inserts here. Then our deck becomes this order. And for the second step, we pick the top card and insert it uniformly to the deck. So maybe it's inserted here. So now what we have is save five. And we repeat the same procedure. So each time we, re we pick up the top card and insert it uniformly back to the, card, to the deck. And we can imagine that after time long enough, finally we'll get a uniform deck. So the question is, how long we should wait until to get a uniform deck? And from this uh, rule of the game, we can see that for this first card, after the first step, the location of one is already uniform in the deck because we inserted it uniformly into the deck. So after first step, this guy is already uniform in the deck. And then in the third step, this guy will become uniform in the deck. But what happens to this guy? So this, after the first step, we can see that with high probability, this five is still very close to the end of the deck. And after the second step, it is still with high probability that this five is still at the end of the deck. So after a few steps from the beginning, we can imagine that this guy is still with high probability uh, at the bottom of the deck. So in order to get a uniform deck, we can imagine that this guy is the most difficult one to become uniform in the deck. And we can also imagine, we can also guess that after this guy is uniform in the deck, then the whole deck will become uniform. So our question is, how long must we shuffle until the orders in the deck is uniform? A simpler question is, how long we need to wait until this guy to become uniform in the deck? And we call this guy is the original bottom card. 
或者 our initial bottom card， 嗯 ，original bottom card。So our simpler question is how long we need to wait until this original bottom card become uniform in the deck, and then the answer is the answer. If we define a time top, top top, it is the first time that this in original bottom card. I write it in this way, so big. And this is the original bottom card. So the first time that this card become the top, uh, become the top of the deck, and the plus one, then we can imagine at this time the original bottom card will become uniform, because. The first time that original bottom card becomes to the top of the deck, and after and for the next step, we will pick up this top and insert it uniformly into the deck, and then so this time plus one will give us a time that this original bottom card is uniform in the deck. So this is the answer to the simpler question, and in fact, I tell you that for this answer. To the simpler question, it is also the answer to the original question. So this is also the time we need to wait until we get a uniform deck. So the theorem says, if this x n corresponds to top to random shuffle, And we define top top in this way. So it is the first time that our original bottom card becomes the top of the deck, and plus one. At this time, the whole process, the whole deck, x top top is uniform. Or uh, another way, every card is uniform in this deck. So why this is true? In fact, we can prove a stronger statement. The statement says, given a time n, suppose there are k cards. Suppose there are k cards and their original bottom card. Then these k cards are uniformly. Uh, then these k cards are uniformly uh, random in the in this in the R or ordering in this k collimation positions. So this is a stronger claim. So given at the time n, there are k cards under the original bottom card. Then this k cards is uniform. And of course, if we take a given time at this time tau, uh, tau top, then uh, consequences it shows that all the cards are uniform in the deck. Okay, so how to prove this stronger statement? We prove by induction on n. So when n equals zero, there's nothing to prove because there is no cards under the original bottom card, and I suppose. The conclusion is true for n equals n, and let us see what happens. What happens at consider uh, what happens at m plus one. 
Okay, so the conclusion is true for n equals m, and at the time m, suppose there are k cards enter the original bottom card. And from the induction hypothesis, we know that these k cards are uniform. And what happens at m plus 1? So at time m, this is our original bottom card. And there are k cards under it. And there are n minus k minus 1 cards above it. This is what happens at time m. And for m plus 1, what we do is, we need to pick the top card and insert it uniformly into the deck. So there are two possibilities. Either we insert it be below the original bottom card, or we insert it above the original bottom card. OK, so there are two cases. If this top card, if the top card is inserted, above the original bottom card. Then there's nothing happened to the cards below the original bottom card. And of course, these k cards still are uniform distributed by induction hypothesis. So well done. So if it is inserted above n, then nothing changes to, the, to these k cards. And if the top card is inserted below the original bottom card. Then what happens? So first of all, we know that this K card is uniform. And this top card is also uniform with all K plus 1 possible positions. So this K plus 1 cards. It's still uniform. So this proves the claim. So the claim says, given a time n, suppose there are k cards under the original bottom card, then these k cards are uniform. So we prove by uh, induction, uh, by induction on the number n. And this also shows that. At this time tau, this is a special time tau, we know that the deck is uniform. And here we can also say that the stationary measure for this Markov chain should be the uniform measure. <coughs> because finally, for time long enough, the Markov chain will become uniform. So in this theorem, <coughs> we see that x tau is uniform. And we can also see that the stationary distribution pi is the uniform measure. And next, we want to see how fast the Markov chain converges to the stationary distribution. And from the previous convergence theorem, we know that this convergence rate will be exponentially fast. But for the constant c and alpha in that theorem, it is true for any finite state space Markov chain. But for our particular random model, in fact, we can uh, precisely find the constant and the decay rate. OK, so this theorem tells us how fast this top to random shuffle model converge to the stationary distribution. So here, uh, ID means identity, because we start from a, a very well ordered deck. So we start from ID. And this pn is the law of the random variable xn at time n. And this pi is the uniform measure. We know it is the stationary distribution. And in this theorem, we will show that this, this total variation distance is bounded by a constant times exponential to the, constant, to the power that small n over big n. 
So before the previous convergence theorem, we just showed that there exists a C and an alpha satisfies so that it is converge, it is less than C times alpha to the power N. And in fact, in this model, we can find what is this C and what is this alpha. In this theorem, I will only show the upper bound. In fact, you can also show the lower bound. Of course, they can't be the same thing, but you can also show that there exists another constant such that this is greater than this guy. So this exponential rate, one over n here, is the optimal one. But of course, I will only show the, the upper bound. OK, so how to show the convergence rate? From the previous theorem, we, can, or we already see that this time tau is something interesting, because we know that at this time tau, this deck is already uniform. So it has the same law as the stationary distribution. And now we just want to compare what's the distance between x and and the stationary distribution. So roughly speaking, we want to compare with the law of xn and x tau. So a uh, rough idea is, if this n happens after time tau, then we already become uniform. So the distance between uniform measures should be zero. But if n happens, but if n is before time tau, there is, this, there is the distance. OK, so in fact, why this is true is not trivial. And this is an exercise to be discussed uh, on October 5th. So why this is true is not trivial. But the rough idea is clear, because it's just cars, it just tells us if n is greater than tau, then they are already, they, it is already uniform. But if n is less than tau, then there are still distance between the two random variables. So in fact, this is not trivial. And uh, you will see how to show this one on the exercise in next week. OK, so the total variation distance is bounded by the probability that tau is greater than n. So now we need to derive what's the law of tau. And now we define yn. It is the height of the original bottom cart at time n. And clearly, this tau is the first time that y reaches big n and plus 1. So we need to check what's the law of the yn. yn is the height of the original bottom cart at, tau, at time n. So what's the law of this yn? Suppose at time n, there are k cards under the original bottom card. Then what happens to the next step? There are two possibilities. Either we insert the top card above the original bottom card, or we insert the top card below the original bottom card. And this corresponds to the height of the next time is k, or the height increased by 1. And here, because when we insert the top card to the, origin, to the deck, we insert it uniformly. So for this case, we insert it above the original card. And the probability is k over big N. So in fact, it's k plus 1 over big N. OK. And for this guy, it is 1 minus k over N. And here we see that this yn has exactly the same law as the coupon collecting we introduced in the last lecture. The coupon collecting is exactly the same as this jumping transition matrix. So if we have k cards, uh, k types at time n for the next coupon, either we increase by one type or we, okay. So 
So it's a little difference be between the coupon collecting, because in coupon collecting, it is one minus k here and k over n there. But OK, so it's almost the same. And here, we can see that this time tau is the first time that yn reaches big n. So it corresponds to the first time that we have all n coupons. So the time tau is the same as, has the same law as the time has the same time as the time in coupon collecting. It's the first time that we collected all n coupons and a plus one. And in coupon collecting model, in coupon collecting model, we know that, so in coupon collecting, We show that for the coupon collecting time tau, it is greater than n log n plus alpha n is less than e to the power minus alpha. This is for coupon collecting. This is what we proved in the first lecture. And now we have just shown that this, can, this time tau top is the same as the time, has the same law as the time in coupon collecting. So this, this tells us for this time tau, uh, time tau top, we have the same estimate. And if we write this event in another way, so tau top greater than smaller n, and this smaller n equals this guy, we can exactly derive that This probability is bounded by n times e to the power minus n over n. So this shows that the total variation distance here is less than this probability. So here we have proved that the convergence of the top to random shuffle to the uniform measure decay exponentially fast. And we can specify the constant here and also the constant there. OK, and this is, this is all for today. Thank you for your attention.